You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Welcome to the Friday edition of Bloomberg's Balance of Power. You made it to the threshold of the weekend and we have good news. It's Groundhog Day, right? It's supposed to be the same every day. And well, I guess maybe it is in terms of the data. Remember last week's stronger than expected GDP report. Better than expected news on inflation. Now payrolls, this number, 353,000, pretty remarkable as the unemployment rate holds at 3.7%. That is the most workers added in a year. Wages jumping in a surprise reacceleration. We can find some good and potentially some scary. But if you're at the White House, it's all good. Ringing the bell today, popping the cork, at least on the economic news, as we see the statement from Joe Biden. America's economy is strongest in the world. Today we saw more proof, and you know how he likes to say, it's not an accident. This is because of the administration's economic policies. And then we look at the polls and we wonder where the disconnect is happening. But let's get into this right now uh, with someone who spent time with Joe Biden in the White House. In fact, one of his closest economic advisors, uh, Bharat Ramamurthy, former deputy director of the White House National Economic Council. He's now senior advisor at the Economic Security Project. Bharat, it's great to see you. Now that you're free to speak about all of these things, including the Fed, did we just take May off the table? I don't think so. I think that May is very much in play. And frankly, I think that the data suggests that March should be in play, too, despite what uh, Chair Powell said. But look, to, to, yeah. to talk about the jobs report a little bit, it, it was a blockbuster, like you said, uh, defying expectations once more. Um, and under the hood, a lot of good data as well about wa- wages, as you noted. Uh, the the uh, employment to population ratio went up, meaning, other, in other words, people are being pulled back into the labor market. Uh, attracted by the the prospect mm-hmm. of good jobs at higher wages, uh, really just a strong report across the board, um, and suggests that uh, the underlying characteristics of the American economy uh, remain extremely strong. I, I earlier today called it the Energizer Bunny economy. It just keeps growing and growing and growing. Well, it sure seems like it. it wages accelerating from a month earlier up the most, uh, as you refer to here, since March of 2022. I know that. You know, this is frankly good news for the president when he says, hey, we're putting more money in your pockets. But it does have an inflationary effect for a White House that's hoping to have inflation under control uh, in an election cycle here. Barat, I, I guess I'm wondering if this should be seen as good news or bad news. Hey, look, the Fed looks at a, a variety of measures when it comes to wages. The the employment cost index, which came out earlier this week, didn't suggest that there was a massive reacceleration uh, of wages. And the Fed tends to view that as a more a reliable barometer. I, you know, I, I think, look, it's important to remember that the Fed has a dual mandate. It has to worry about price stability and it has to w- worry about maximum employment. And if you look mm-hmm. currently at the balance of risks, you look at the the data that has come in over the last several months about the trajectory of inflation, the fact that we know there's more disinflation in the pipeline coming from the housing sector, uh, and the fact that while we had a good blockbuster jobs report today, there are some concerning signs that when you look at the hiring rate and other factors in the labor market. Uh, And then finally, consider the fact that that monetary policy operates with a lag and it's better to be out in front uh, of issues rather than being reactive. All of that to me suggests that the Fed uh, should be looking to cut very, very soon. Interesting. Consumer sentiment, meantime, Borat, to the highest since mid-2021, and we all remember where we were then. When you take the sort of composite view of the data that we've gotten over the past couple of months here, you may not be taking March or even May off the table, but are we taking a recession finally off the table? Look, I think it would take something pretty unexpected at this point to uh, knock the the economy off the trajectory that it's on. Uh, That said, we've experienced a lot of unexpected things over the last couple of years, whether it's uh, COVID variants that we weren't necessarily anticipating of course, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, those were serious economic headwinds that the American economy has managed to weather so far. It's possible that we could see uh, other unexpected headwinds in the months to come. But again, the mm-hmm. underlying data, things like consumer spending, the state of household balance sheets, business investment, all of that uh, paints a very strong picture of where the economy is. And there's very little uh, concern, I, in, in my mind, that it can be knocked off course. That said, 
I think the biggest variable we have to consider at the moment is the Fed's approach. And I, I worry that if the Fed takes too long to start cutting rates, uh, that that could end up mm -hmm. having a negative effect as you get into the second half of the year. Well, God knows uh, we understand that Jay Powell doesn't want to cut too early. History has proven uh, how deadly that move can be. So is he is he wrong in his view right now or just being careful? Look, the, the Fed is data driven. It has been data driven throughout this process. I, I think the fact that, uh, that, that that that's not unexpected, given the fact that uh, that's the way Chair Powell has been uh, throughout his tenure at the Fed and the other uh, great folks on the Fed board. I expect them to continue to be data driven going forward. I, to me, the balance of the data that we have gotten on both inflation and the state of the labor market suggests that you know, the risks of inflation reaccelerating and the risks of uh, dropping below maximum employment are fairly well balanced, which suggests that a cut should be coming. If you look at the, the real effective interest rate, it's over, you know, it's over 5% right now. Inflation is running at 2%. That means real rates are pretty high, uh, relatively speaking. And so all of that suggests mm -hmm. that a cut uh, is, is an appropriate course of action. It, it will matter a lot what the data looks like in the next couple of months leading into that March meeting. We got a lot to learn, as always. Data dependent with Bharat Ramamurti. Great to see you, Bharat. Thank you for the insights today. Formerly uh, of the White House, and now at the American Economic Liberties Project. I'm Joe Matthew in Washington. As we're spinning a couple of plates here today, it's been that case all week long. Here, as the president right now is not in the nation's capital, he kicked out that statement that I read earlier via email. He's in fact in Dover today in Delaware for the dignified transfer meeting with grieving families at Dover Air Base today in honor of the three American servicemen who were killed last weekend, which brings us to the matter at hand in Washington, and that's retaliation. We heard from the Secretary of Defense a couple of days ago at this point talking about multi-tiered strikes, but still nothing, not a concerted attack against Iranian proxies, a little more lobbing around with Houthi rebels, but not what we've been waiting for here, and there's a great question about why the Pentagon and the administration have telegraphed things to this point. That's why we want to bring in uh, Brett Bruin is with us, who heads, of course, the Global Situation Room, a former diplomat uh, at the White House with a long career in national security. Brett, it's great to see you. What do you make of the messaging that we've been hearing from the administration these past couple of days and the fact that we haven't seen anything yet? Well, let me start on that last point, Joe. I, I think the fact we have not seen anything yet is a good sign. Uh, it means that we are preparing likely a longer, uh, more strategic rather than just a superficial strike. At the same time, to your earlier question about the messaging, I'm a little bit befuddled as to why the president and his national security team are uh, essentially telegraphing that we are going to pull our punches. Um, this, yeah. I think, sends the wrong signal to Tehran. It sends the wrong signal to other adversaries. Um, and look, I'm not embracing the Republican line that this is uh, a demonstration of weakness. I just don't think that um, we ought to be responding to an attack that killed three of our soldiers by saying, well, we're going to do something, but it's not going to be a big thing. Right. There's news today that Iran is pulling uh, senior Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps officers out of Syria because, I'm assuming, of this telegraphing in advance of expected airstrikes. Brett, is that the point, to, to have the snake recoil? Well, partially. And, and you also want to keep in mind, Joe, what is our longer term strategy here? I think it's important and the Biden team would be successful if they are able to push back Iranian extracurricular activities across the Middle East. If that is the outcome of both our strikes as well as our strategy here, then that would be encouraging. I think it would help to stabilize not just the Houthis in Yemen or uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, support for Bashar al-Assad in Syria. But it would, I think, send a, a strong uh, message to others in the region that things are getting back to a more stable place, a more predictable place, and that Iran will be put back in the box, at least for a period of time. I'm going to ask you what you think should be done here, but... The story yesterday about Iran slowing production of enriched uranium, when you couple that on top of the withdrawals that I just mentioned, is that evidence that telegraphing 
is working? Well, I think what we're seeing from Iran, and you've read the same news reports, certainly, that I have, where uh, there is an indication Iranian leaders did not necessarily have direct involvement in this drone strike. So they're trying to say, look, look, uh, we realize this may have been a, a step too far, and they are working on trying uh, through some of those back channels as well as the public messaging to say, OK, we will take at least a strategic step back. And I, I do think that that's part of what's going into the calculation right now of how do we reduce, as Admiral John Kirby said, some of those capabilities, some of those missile sites, some of those drone sites, while at the same time not going to a point where Iran feels the need that they have to up the ante here. So let's talk about what might come in the days ahead. We've heard about attacks being planned against uh, Iranian officials in Iraq and Syria specifically. Maybe there won't be that many left, but that's as opposed to a direct attack against Iran, Brett. Is that what you expect? I do, because I think if we uh, cross the Rubicon and strike directly into Iranian territory, that would force a response from Tehran. Whereas if we are able to take out some of those capabilities in Iraq, in Syria, in Yemen, that will send a, a pretty significant message to Iranian leaders without forcing them into a corner where they feel their national sovereignty, where they feel uh, that their power has uh, been challenged to a point that they are forced to hit back. And let's not forget, Joe, Iranian leaders, because of years now of economic sanctions after Trump pulled out of the nuclear deal, the JCPOA, are already yep. in a somewhat vulnerable, somewhat precarious position. So we've got to factor that in and, and ensure that um, our efforts are, are done in such a way that we don't allow an even more extreme group of characters to take power in Iran. We're spending time with Brett Bruin of the Global Situation Room. We talk about this disparate group of Iranian-backed proxies as if we have a sense uh, of the whole chain of command here, Brett. There's reporting in Politico today that American intelligence officials believe Tehran does not have full control of these proxy groups. Is that more reason to avoid a strike against Tehran? And does that make it more difficult to, to understand what happens next? Well, first, I think that's accurate. Look, Iran has set up a wide web of relationships with groups that help to serve different purposes and help Iran to pull and puppeteer, uh, both in terms of the internal politics of some of these countries like uh, Iraq, Syria, Yemen. But at the same time, Iran um, isn't uh, there sitting in a command center with these folks. Um, they may be providing them the drones, the missiles, the wherewithal to engage in some of those activities, generally giving them a strategic direction. But Iran, I, I think, has not um, established these as uh, direct lines of uh, command from Tehran out to uh, some of those sites. And what we're seeing are the risks and, and really, quite frankly, the dangers in, in that model. And Tehran may learn a lesson from this experience. Well, you like to think so. Is there anything to the idea of holding off, maybe doing a couple of precision strikes here in the weeks ahead and potentially hitting these groups much harder when they regroup in the spring? Well, there may be, but I would say that the expectation has been set, uh, both from the Pentagon as well as the White House, that we are going to see yeah. a series, and potentially an extended series uh, of strikes. I think the goal will be to diminish, to damage that capability that Iranian groups or Iranian-backed groups have. But, you know, the other, Joe, which is um, key here, is where we can hold out a threat of more. If Iran does try to rapidly rebuild, re, um, constitute these groups, if Iran does continue to aggressively um, stoke the flames, the embers um, in the regional fires that are burning, then we will take, and this doesn't necessarily have to be a public message, but we get the message through, for instance, the Swiss embassy, which is our interlocutor in Tehran, we get the message yeah. through to Iranian leaders, there isn't going to be tolerance for any more of this. And they wait. Brett, it's great to see you. Brett Bruin from the Global Situation Room at the Townhouse in Old Town. 
with us here on Bloomberg. Always a great conversation with Brett Bruin as the Bidens today, again, attending the dignified transfer of the remains of the troops killed last weekend. They are in Dover today, along with the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. I'm Joe Matthew. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. With a gravity-defying jobs report this morning, that, as always, is going to be interpreted a bit differently in Washington than it is on Wall Street, depending on who you ask, of course. The administration sees this as all good news. With payrolls and wages rising, there may be some inflation concerns, but the statement from Joe Biden is clear. Out quickly after the data, quote, America's economy is the strongest in the world. And today we saw more proof with another month of strong wage gains and employment gains of over 350,000 in January. That's where we start our conversation with Bloomberg White House correspondent Josh Wingrove, who joins us from the North Lawn. And I presume, Josh, they're popping some corks inside the building there today as this president has another good story to tell. And it definitely challenges the idea that this is an economy headed for recession. Yeah, Joe, absolutely. I mean, this is a president who's got a lot of his aides from the sort of labor side of the economic pool. The employment numbers have always been one of the top, if not the top indicator for them. So while markets are sort of assessing whether this sort of Goldilocks landing is maybe not possible or less possible given the sort of heat of today's numbers, it still feels very Goldilocks to the Biden White House uh, behind me in looking at these things. Now, you know, they continue to tout some of the specifics. You mentioned wages sort of shrugging off mm-hmm. some of the weakness on hours work by saying weather effects played a role in them. And of course, they pointed to particular groups who continue to have really low, near record or record low unemployment rates, such as black Americans. So this is a story that they're going to be talking about a lot on the trail. And of course, the flip side of this is it might make the Fed wait a little bit longer. And that means rate cuts coming later for Joe Biden, which, you know, he, they don't mm-hmm. talk about the Fed, but surely I think they'd like Fed cuts, politically speaking, uh, as soon as feasibly possible. Well, they could coincide with the second half of the year, Josh, when folks are really making up their minds, I suppose, on who they want to vote for. It's about connecting with voters, though, Josh. We saw our Bloomberg News Morning Consult swing state poll this week, and the president is underwater in a lot of important places. We're going to talk in a moment with Congresswoman Debbie Dingell from one of those places, and that's Michigan. There is time, clearly, uh, to, to improve messaging or to somehow get the word out. But where does this White House go? They've been beating the drum on this economy and Bidenomics for months and months. And it just doesn't seem to show up in the polling. Yeah, I was with the president yesterday in Michigan with Congresswoman Dingell. Uh, she, I'm sure, will tell you he got a pretty warm reception in that UAW Union Hall. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, they're yeah. trying to get their message out to whatever group they can. We did ask this very question, like, hey, when are you going to get a bounce from this, right? To Jared Bernstein, uh, a familiar face to Bloomberg viewers, of course, the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors Indeed. this morning. And he, and he said... Look, you know, if this keeps going and people's wages keep rising in a way that outpaces inflation, in other words, real wage growth, and jobs are strong and, you know, wage growth is strong and we don't really have any signs of a recession, then he he said flatly, we're confident this is going to start to show up in the numbers. And of course, he pointed to the University of Michigan sentiment data today that shows it's showing up in sentiment numbers. So, you know, he is saying basically, I'm not a political expert, but a matter of time before eventually people will start feeling better about it. But polls right now, Joe, as you know, have a very just partisan lens on them, arguably more than ever. So whether this really translates sort of like for like, pound for pound into Biden's polling, it's Mm -hmm. hard to imagine that happening. But will he see a boost? The White House is signaling that they, they hope to or at least expect to. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that consumer sentiment index. Highest today since mid-2021, and we have come a long way uh, since then, Josh Wingrove. Uh, Some of our analysts, including Rick Davis, would tell you that that is a far more accurate gauge than a lot of political polls, a lot of campaign polls are this far out from an election. That's got to be good news for this White House. And does it give us an indication of where public opinion might be months down the road? Yeah, they're hoping it's a leading indicator. You know, Biden... Democrats right. don't traditionally run on the economy per se, but Biden kind of wants to, in particular in states like Michigan when he went yesterday, where they want to talk about defending unions, they want to talk about manufacturing jobs, and they want to draw a contrast to Donald Trump. You know, we're finally gearing up for this Trump-Biden rematch. A lot of people 
didn't necessarily think yeah. it was going to happen. So, uh, you know, some people still don't think it's going to happen. This is certainly barring a major surprise where it's headed. Uh, so we're headed for a rematch. We're going to hear a lot of uh, the this, this sort of contrast questions. Biden always likes to say, don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. Well, now he's got an alternative. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be hearing a lot more about this from them. But the question is, of course, can it bring those numbers up? You mentioned our Bloomberg polls, right. not to put too fine a point on it. He's trailing Trump in every one of those seven swing states, including Michigan, mm -hmm. in that poll. There's time left, but right now our polling shows that Joe Biden is an underdog to win a second term. Josh, it's good to see you. Thank you for the insights uh, from the White House with us. Josh Wingrove, Bloomberg White House correspondent, who again was traveling, as he mentioned, with the president yesterday uh, in Michigan. And we want to go there now uh, to bring in Congresswoman Debbie Dingell, of course, a Democratic ally of President Biden, but somebody who understands the contours of a very important state that we pre pretend to know here in Washington. Uh, and I wonder uh, what we might learn here in our conversation. Representative Dingell, it's great to see you. Welcome back. I'd like to start with this jobs report because this is the kind of story that the president wants to tell and frankly has been telling. Is it perplexing to see this not connect with public opinion or can you draw on your experience to tell us that it, it will show up in the next couple of months, that this is a leading indicator? So I think, look, I'm somebody that knows uh, it really matters when you go into that poll, into that voting booth, how you feel. Polls yeah. are, everybody thought Hillary Clinton was going to win that election, except for a few of us. Uh, and the polls were still showing she was going to win election day. And people told me I was crazy when I for months said Donald <laughs> Trump could and then would win the election. I think that we've all been through a very difficult time. The cost in grocery stores has remained high. People are seeing job security. We've seen significant labor uh, negotiations, which is giving people real wage increases. And now it's our job to get, it's not just the president's job, it's our job to get in the union halls and give him the credit that he deserves for what he has actually done the last few years. Tell me what's happening in union halls, because you were in one yesterday uh, with the president. He's received the endorsement of the UAW. And we know as well that Donald Trump has been courting the union vote here. I'm sure you have very strong feelings about that. But he's talking to Teamsters members who already voted for him once. How does Joe Biden take the power of walking the picket line and turn it into something real here? So I think he needs to go in and connect with those workers. And it's also it's great to get an endorsement from a union leader, and that's a good thing. But quite frankly, for the last few years or decades, people aren't getting into those halls. They're not doing the door to door. They're not talking to each other about what's really happened. I know that in the instance of the UAW, uh, President Fain was not one of the early presidents that came to. He did the comparison of what Donald Trump had done for auto workers, but President Biden had done for auto workers. He doesn't give his name lightly, and he is going to work to do everything he can. He's going to be in those halls. He's going to talk to every worker. He's going to tell them, Donald Trump hasn't delivered for you. He didn't care if you got a pay raise. He didn't care if you had a pension that was going to be protected. He didn't care if you got health care. Donald Trump is very good at playing on people's fears, but not delivering. We and other union I mean, I'm going to get in every union hall I can so that I can show how Joe Biden yeah. has actually delivered for the worker. Well, I find it interesting, confusing, sometimes fascinating. I don't know what the right word is, Congresswoman. When Joe Biden goes and talks to union members about the power of organized labor, about the future, in this case, of the auto industry, some of the nuances that come with union membership. Donald Trump shows up. He talks about the border. And he talks about the fact that China is going to own them when EVs come around. Does Joe Biden need a sharper message? So this is what I'm going to say to you. That, I mean, Donald Trump was very effective. I'm always very honest that in 15, 14, 15, 16, we did a terrible job as Democrats talking about trade. I knew what these workers had all seen their jobs shipped overseas to Mexico and to Asia, and they didn't want to see that happen anymore. Joe Biden has brought those jobs home. People are worried about people coming into the border and over the border, and they're worried about safety and national security, but they're also worried that they might take their job away. And the fact of the matter is, is we have too many small businesses. We need caregiving farmers that don't have people to fill the jobs. And 
And secondly, I'm an up-car girl. You know that. I worked for the auto industry yeah. for more decades than I'm going to admit. I remember the 70s. I was young. But we lost, the domestic auto market lost our competitive advantage for more than a decade because we weren't ready when there was a demand for small cars because of increased gasoline costs. EVs are, we're in a competing in a global marketplace. That's a fact. And I'm not going to cede our leadership to China or anything. EVs are part of our future, and we're going to build them here in America. He uses fear yeah. language. Our job is to talk about how we are comp protecting ourselves competitively and protecting the environment at the same time. Spending time with Congresswoman Debbie Dingell of Michigan as we walk down the campaign trail just a bit. I'd like to ask you about some of the stuff that's happening in Congress uh, right now, Representative. But before we move from the campaign trail, the matter of criticism from Arab Americans, from uh, Islamic Americans, Muslim Americans in your state, you've got a large population. It's an important demographic in Michigan. It's something that we've been hearing a lot about, of course, since Joe Biden spoke so forcefully in support of Israel uh, in its war against Hamas. This is something that has turned into a, a repeated instance of heckling when he's in person. We're seeing protests in Washington that are that are shutting down traffic on some mornings. How much of a liability is this going to be in your state? So I, these issues, I'm someone who tells the truth. These are very serious issues. I lived in Dearborn, Michigan for almost 40 years. Those people, the, the city, residents of Dearborn are, are my neighbors, my friends. They have family yeah. that lives over there. They have family that has died. They have family that doesn't have food. They don't have access to water. They have no place to live. We, the, Hamas is a terrorist group. What they did to Israel was absolutely horrific and cannot be condoned. But at the same time, we need a ceasefire right now. More than 30,000 innocent people have died over there, 12,000 children, a Jewish baby, a Palestinian baby, they're babies. We need to protect our children. We need a two-state solution. Uh, the president has to address it. He knows that he does. He's always been for a two-state solution. I know there are a lot of diplomatic things going on, and people say they can't talk about everything. They're going to have to become much more public and uh, telling people what is going on and addressing this head on in the next few weeks. You speak on a very personal level uh, about this, Congresswoman. Did you deliver that message to the president yesterday? Any conversation that I have with somebody like that is private and personal. People know I'm I, when people talk to me, they know what I'm thinking. But I yeah, just, I believe you know, that. and I do think I have a, I'm very I, I, Israel has a right to exist. I mean, this is why I think a whole lot of American people are where I am. What Hamas did was horrific. It was a terrorist act. But you cannot watch these innocent children these families die it's horrific it's just it's a horrific situation well i know that there's talk about a, 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 a ceasefire how about another pause how about a, a couple of days to get more hostages out that's a bit all the hostages have to be returned that called for the immediate release of them and i want to see them get home it's a very complicated situation i'm clearly not at the state department or the white house negotiating this but the debt that the killing has to stop, but they're not getting humanitarian aid there. You don't know how hard it is to help, trying to help families that I represent who have fathers and stepmothers and half siblings over there. And they've got the visas they can't get across the border. And if you talk to people that are over there, the, the humanitarian aid is not getting through the bridges. It's not crossing in there. We need far more humanitarian aid than they're getting there than is there. What's it like being a Democrat here from Michigan who engages with constituents on the extent that you do? The way you're talking makes me feel like your phone's ringing off the hook. I talk to people. Look, I have been protested. I've been docked six times. I talk to everybody. Ugh. And they know I don't, when people are upset, I go and meet with them. I, I, they're, they, I talk to people. And that's one of the reasons yeah. why I have good gut. I knew when we were in trouble when Donald Trump won because I was in those union halls and they didn't think Democrats cared about their jobs. Right now, we have to, I mean, I know people are worried about both candidates, but I'm going to tell you about Donald Trump. He's the one that calls Muslims vermin, that they'll poison our blood. They should be banned from being here. 
Right now, mm. the killing's got to stop. We need a two-state solution, but it's uh, we and we've got to move forward. In our remaining moments here, Congresswoman, you know what else they say Democrats have a problem with is the border here in the U.S. Are we going to see a deal that can pass the House? The Speaker says it's DOA, but I can't tell if this is bluster or if we're on the verge of a major breakthrough. I think it's ironic. This is a very tough issue. There have been Republican presidents and Democratic presidents that have tried to deal with it. George Bush got close, and it ends up blowing up. We are sent to Congress to do tough jobs. We actually have people agreeing to something. Compromise isn't a dirty word. And things that the progressive caucus is going crazy over and Republicans are going to kill it. They cannot say that they're serious about wanting something done at the border and then kill the most realistic and significant border bill, immigration bill that has been negotiated. I haven't even seen it, so I don't even know what I think. But saying a a bill is dead on arrival before you've even seen it doesn't mean that you're serious about (laughs) you want it as a political issue you don't want to solve the problem debbie dingle reminds us of a point of fact with all the hand wringing and gnashing of teeth there's still no text we think we might see it tonight they say it will emerge by the weekend congresswoman i want to thank you for the time come and see us in person Uh, Next time you're back in Washington, D.C., Debbie Dingell, Democrat from Michigan's sixth, was with the president yesterday and speaking passionately here about some of the most important issues that we're hearing about on both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue. We'll assemble our panel next. Jeannie Shanzano and Rick Davis dive in on our conversation with Debbie Dingell and whether anything of meaning will emerge from Congress as we wait for text on the border. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Appreciate your being with us here on Bloomberg's Balance of Power. I'm Joe Matthew in Washington here on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg TV. Find us on YouTube as well. Kaylee is off today as we turn our attention to day 100. Some didn't think Mike Johnson would make it. The Speaker of the House, day 100 with gavel in hand and big questions about what might happen this weekend when a border deal emerges from the Senate. We could, as we've been reporting, see text as soon as tonight. Following our conversation with Congresswoman Debbie Dingell, I'm kind of wondering how this goes. Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzano are with us now as we assemble our political panel on a Friday. Bloomberg Politics contributors. Uh, Jeannie, you could hear the passion Maybe the frustration in Debbie Dingell's voice as we walk through some of these issues here. When it comes to a border deal, could this pass the Senate, never mind the House, considering the opposition that we've been hearing from Republicans? You know, I certainly hope so. Hope so. It, it is, a, you know, to use the Republicans' own words, appalling if it doesn't for purely, you know, just nakedly political reasons. We need to have border security. We also need a sound immigration policy that doesn't seem, we haven't seen the bill that is part of this, but we do need border security. You know, I'm here in New York. We had the attack on police officers in New York City and now have our governor calling for the deportation of those assailants, some of whom seem to have fled the state. So we do Mm. need border security. And the idea that because any political candidate for office is calling for a weight on something this important for his own ends, and that would be Donald Trump, is appalling and it shouldn't happen. So the Senate should pass it. The House should take it up and pass it. Listen, Republicans have gotten what they wanted. The president, much to the chagrin of the left wing of his party, said, I will do what you want on security. And now they're saying no because they don't want him to get a bill passed. Yeah. Rick, 100 days into his tenure, Speaker Mike Johnson does not seem compelled to entertain this bill. He's already called it DOA. Chuck Schumer's going for it, though, and he's got the support of Mitch McConnell here. The deal will be made public no later than Sunday. That would set up the first procedural vote uh, no later than next Wednesday. Is there strategy here in, in jamming the House, if we can call it that? Don't listen to the noise. Just plow ahead. Well, it wouldn't be the first time <clears throat> that the Senate has jammed the House of Representatives. So, yeah, it's a it's yeah. a 
tried and true uh, strategy. And obviously the, the, the writers of this bill, they don't want to get nitpicked to death. Uh, by letting it swim around too much. So uh, the reality is they're going to give people plenty of time to vote on it. They'll know what they're voting on when they do. And I would expect a pretty lopsided vote in the Senate. I think they're going to send this uh, to the House with a pretty good head of steam on it. And of course, we've heard throughout this program when we've talked about it, uh, it's only dead on arrival until they shape it up to their will, right? And I have no doubt that Mm -hmm. there'll be something that the the Speaker will want to add to this bill or take out that will make it more to his liking, but there'll be an enormous amount of pressure to do something. You already see it starting to label. And so it's like the entire country, Republicans and Democrats and independents alike, against Donald Trump and the speaker being in the middle. So we'll see whether or not the speaker picks the country or Trump. Well, that's quite a decision to make, Jeannie, uh, as we stare down the barrel of another potential government shutdown now as well. Mike Johnson indicating to Fox earlier today that he will not do another stopgap funding measure. That's less than a month away. March 1st, March 8th are the two shutdown days in our laddered CR, as the wonks call it here in Washington. But if that's the case, no one seems to think we have time to write a real budget in the next month. Do we shut down and delay the State of the Union address the first week of March? Oh, Joe, it's feeling like Groundhog Day when you have Mike Johnson saying no, How about no, it? no, no. Yeah, there he goes again. You know, listen, if there is no time, he can say all he wants, as he did before, that he will not support a CR and maybe he means it. But the idea that they would shut down the government rather than pass a CR and get a sound budget for this country is absolutely astonishing. I don't think it will happen. It doesn't work for the Republicans benefit. It doesn't work for the Democrats. But I think If he passes this CR, you know, we've got to be empathetic to Mike Johnson. His job could very well be at stake. And that is the state of the Republican Party today. And, you know, so you feel for the guy. But the reality is there cannot be a shutdown. Pass another laddered CR if you have to and get to work on passing these bills. So I guess I don't know the best way to ask this question, Rick. What's more likely, a government shutdown or the speaker getting fired? Or both, right? I mean, the two aren't mutually exclusive. Uh, you know, Fair it only enough. takes one Republican or one Democrat to put that whole thing in play. So uh, they haven't gotten around to changing their rules. The re- the reality is there nobody gains with a government shutdown. Republicans will look foolish. They're in control of this. Uh, they've made lots of promises that they can actually move a budget. They need to move a budget. Uh, and, and, and I'm glad he actually uh, said, the speaker did, that he wasn't going to do any more of these CRs because he shouldn't do any more of these CRs. There's absolutely no reason why they can't get the rest of these appropriations bills done on time. Is that true, Jeannie? Do you have faith in these guys with a a relatively challenging calendar? We've got an impeachment vote coming. We're talking about it. Obviously, we've got the tax deal to manage. How do you get a, a whole budget through these two chambers when it still hasn't happened yet this fiscal year? It's going to be tough and the calendar never works in their favor. Don't forget the FAA. Don't forget FISA. I mean, there's so much on the plate, but the number one thing they have to do is put to get uh, together a budget. I do hope that they are able to do it. But if they are not, the only option then is a CR and they must do that. So God willing, they get the bills written and passed. But if they can't, he should not be taking a CR off the table. If he's doing it just to light a fire under his fellow Republicans, that is fine. But when when it push comes to shove, a laddered CR has yeah. to move versus a shutdown. Well, how about we get real here and cancel recess, Rick? They've got two weeks off coming up. Can we not take that off the board right now? Well, they've had these uh, you know, big milestone uh, issues before, and they've chosen to go home. I mean, it's beyond my comprehension. I don't know if taxpayers in America are going to want to rebate for how little work that these guys have done. And why give Joe Biden the opportunity to criticize you for taking time off? I mean, like if I were a Democrat mm-hmm. strategist right now, I'd be having a ball. Yeah, go ahead and shut down government. Joe Biden will give the uh, State of the Union address from the Oval Office, all by himself, (laughs) to an empty picture of a Congress. You know, I mean, it's nuts. I would be going crazy right now. I mean, come on, guys, do your work, get this done, take credit for something that you've done for the country and and go run for re-election. 
Rick Davis trying to help both sides here, Jeannie. I, I kind of like where he's going, though. If we start to shut down, the State of the Union gets delayed or canceled. Joe Biden has an appointment to talk to the American people that night. Should he not stick to it? Oh, he should absolutely stick to it. And I think that they would. I can't imagine the Republicans giving him that window. But the fact is, the way that caucus works, it's not up really to the leadership there. It's up to some of these fringe members. So this is where the idea when you have a new speaker untested, this becomes really, really challenging. But absolutely, Joe Biden would give that address and he would call them out and it would be a winning argument. But that's not in the interest of the American public or any of us. We need a budget. By the way, we're talking about this in February. You know, this should have been done a long time ago. So it's not as if they didn't have time before either. Yeah, if we were in Jeannie's class at Iona, we all would have failed uh, by now. Rick, uh, President Biden is not at the White House at the moment. He's in Dover uh, for the dignified transfer. He's meeting with the families of fallen Americans, those who were attacked in Jordan last weekend. And it it brings us back to the idea that we could see military action at any moment now in retaliation for what happened. Do you suspect that he will address the the American people on this over the course of the weekend? Uh, Whether or not he addresses the American people, I think that's a flip of a coin. Uh, I, I am a little surprised we haven't seen some kind of retaliatory event already. I mean, a week has gone by this weekend and um, you begin to wonder how much are they thinking about this? Did they not have a plan in place that if somebody is killed in one of these attacks, what are we going to do about it? I mean, you know, it just seems to be a lot of contemplation and not a lot of action. I'm not a national security strategist. There are a lot of moving parts to these kinds of things, but I would think a thoughtful but immediate approach to this is something that could help build back confidence in the military and Joe Biden's leadership as commander in chief. Otherwise, you know, it's sort of same old, same old. Some are encouraged uh, by the deliberation here. The fact that nothing's happened yet. The, the idea of restraint that will act at the time of our own choosing. Jeannie, what do you think? You know, there's a lot of complicating factors, including things that they can't control, like the weather. But I do think that the president should be out there giving an address on this, if for no other reason, because the Middle East has flummoxed and, quite frankly, negatively impacted the last 10 presidencies in the United States. This is a crisis of enormous repercussions for presidents in the U.S., He's got to take this seriously, which we know he is, but he's also got to tell the American public why we are involved and engaged. And he can't just do it once. He's got to do it over and over and over and over Mm -hmm. again, clearly, because it's it's an impact for him politically, for all of us. And we could see just in Debbie Debbie Dingell, Representative Dingell's, you know, the emotion in her voice as somebody who lives in Michigan, the impact of this on the ground. Great conversation, as always, with Rick Davis and Jeannie Shansano. Thanks for listening to the Balance of Power podcast. Make sure to subscribe, if you haven't already, at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can find us live every weekday from Washington, D.C. at noontime Eastern at Bloomberg.com.